All right, so we're looking at a machine in my home lab. I'm gonna show you how to make a partition and put a file system in it, right? Because this is really common stuff that any administrator is gonna eventually gonna have to deal with. There's always this case where something isn't big enough, something needs to be added, whatever, right? So first of all, we're gonna go over some of the tools that we talked about in last week's episode. So if you haven't checked out our troubleshooting episode, go check that out because we had a whole toolbox section where we talked about some of the tools we're gonna touch on right now. So you might remember LSBLK as my favorite tool for seeing what disks are attached to my system because it gives us this nice tree output, it tells us what devices there are, what partitions they're currently on. And you're gonna see that suspicious empty disk VDB. You might guess that's where we're working today. Imagine a ticket came in and I've been asked to add a disk to this system, right? So I've already added a virtual disk to it. VDB tells me that it's a virtual disk, right? This is a virtual machine. If this was a physical disk that would look like SDB, let's look, there's no partitions, there's no mounted file systems on there, but there's a tool called part ed, partition editor, that I like to use for creating and viewing partition information on a disk. There's also F disk. We'll talk about that after the break. So part ed, you tell it what device to work with, dev VDB, we're gonna do print. Oh, not print, it uses abbreviations. I learned something today. I can be lazy and just, what if I just did like P, does that work? Look at that, I could just, hey. I can chop off all those extra letters. <laughs> this tells us the current partition table on the disk. And I already knew it was empty. LS Block told us it was empty. It also gives us information about things like how big is this disk? How many megabytes are available on this disk? This tells us it's five gig. This tells us a, a precise number. Because when making partitions with part ed, you actually specify them in how many meg they should be. So it tells us how many meg are available. So let's just clear the screen so it's easier to see. First of all, I didn't mention this, but you'll see there's no partition table, no label assigned to this machine, or not machine, there's no label, there's no disk label applied to this disk. So we're gonna do a make label first, right? So we're gonna do part ed, dev vdb because it's you always the first command is always the device you want to work on we're going to do mk label and i'm going to use gpt gpt you have a couple options here the most commons are ms dos and gpt ms dos might sound like oh, this is not a dos machine why or not a windows or a microsoft machine why would i use ms dos that's the old disk label expected in, in older disks. GPT allows for larger partitions. On a five gig disk, it doesn't matter much. There may be other nuances, but those are really the two most common options. So we're gonna do GPT. Sorry, I just hit the mic. And now if we do part ed print again, it's gonna tell us the partition table is GPT. And that's important information if you're working with a large disk, because it'll fill in what partition sizes you're allowed. MS-DOS supported up to one or two terabytes. And if you're working in extremely large file systems, GPT will let you use a much bigger uh, partition size, right? So just keep that in mind. If you're working with SAN arrays and stuff or disks that are larger than a couple terabytes. I remember as a systems administrator when uh, one of our, I think it was like a science division at the, at the college came to me and said, hey, we need to store a ridiculous amount of data. I need a four terabyte volume. And I'm like, I can't make one <laughs> because I didn't, at the time, I didn't know GPT existed. We ended up doing this weird LVM thing where we joined them together. Then there were file system issues because of the size we could create at the time, but that's off topic. We've got the disk label. Now we're gonna make a partition. Part Ed will give you prompts. I'm doing these in one-liners because I think it makes it simpler for someone who maybe wants to script this later. Part Ed is good for that. You can do that with FDisk as well. Scott usually does stuff that way with FDisk where he like does FDisk and passes commands into it. But I think Part Ed is cleaner for this. So we're going to do Part Ed again, dev VDB, and then MK Part. Now it asks for the name of the, of the disk. I'm just going to call it disk one. You could call it whatever you want. Make it something that helps you identify it later. I'm gonna put XFS on this. So I could have been like di XFS disk or something like that. And then we need to tell it the start and end of this partition. Now remember, this is working in megabytes. I think you can probably tell it to work in other units, but by default, it's in megabytes. So we're gonna start at one because that's the beginning, but we're gonna do one. Then we're gonna do 2,500 because I wanna make it about 2.5 gigabytes. Remember, five gigabyte disk. Okay, and then we hit enter. It doesn't give a confirmation. It just says, you might have to put this in SEFS tab for this to work. If 
I go back and do another print using our newly discovered abbreviation for print, which is just P, <laughs> you can see we've got a new partition called disk one, no file system, no flags, anything like that. And it's about two and a half gig, which is what I wanted. Now, like I said, I'm going to make a second one as well. I'm going to use the exact same command, except we're going to call it disk two. And we're going to start at 2,500 because that's where our last one ends. You can see right here, it says end 2,500, right? And start at 1K or so. I guess that's about one megabyte or so. I guess we could have started at zero, maybe. I'll try that in some other lab when we're not live. We're going to start at 2,500 and we're going to go to 5,000. Because as we know from the print, we have 5,000 and a little extra available. Now, I could end at... 5,369, and that would fill up the rest of the disk, but I'm just trying to make things simple. Hit enter. If I print again, now we have two disks. Now, disks aren't that helpful unless there's file systems on them. So what? let's do one or two more things. Remember LS block from the beginning? Let's just show here. Now you see we've got VDB1 and VDB2. That's just another way to confirm, yes, the disk was added. It's added to the disk that we thought it was added to. Just not another way to sanity check and make sure everything is exactly where you want it to be. There's nothing more anxiety-inducing than doing disk changes on a production system. Maybe there's other things, like hardware changes or whatever. Oh, the CPU died. We have to replace it. That might be a little worse. On a live system or a production system in a small maintenance window, you need to be extra careful making disk changes. I always like to be extra sure. All right, VDB1, as you might remember, is the one I said earlier we were going to put XFS on. If we do mkfs.xfs, there's other command line options you could use instead. Like mkfs, there's like a, a command line option that'll tell it XFS, but these are like shortcuts to say XFS is the thing I want to make on this system or disk. And we're just going to point it at dev VDB1. This is going to use the defaults for XFS. You can define other options. And uh, after the break, we're going to have a like a toolbox section like we did last time. And we'll show you some options that you could supply for MKFS, XFS to change the disk layout ends up or the, the way the file system gets laid down. But at the very basics, here we go. We've got an XFS file system here. Now, we have a second partition. Just for the sake of comparison, we're going to make an ext4 file system on that one. Same deal. As dot ext4 will make an ext4 file system. We're going to go dev vdb2. Right? That's the second partition we made on that disk. Now, if we do ls block again, you see this didn't change much. But if we do hard ed print, it says file system xfs on disk one and ext4 on disk number two. There's kind of some basics on how to make file systems. There's just like when we were troubleshooting file systems, just basically dealing with file systems, mounting file systems, creating partitions. There's a couple tools and I listed a couple here. We're going to go with some basics here to get started. First of all, I, we used ParteEd in the beginning. Now we're going to talk about FDisk. FDisk is a fine tool, especially because it's been around for so long and a lot of people are familiar with it. In my old MS-DOS days, FDisk was the tool to manage fixed disks, which is what FDisk stands for. I'm sure there's lots of other colloquial names for FDisk, but we're not going to do those live on the air. <laughs> you can script or uh, pass commands through FDisk, but I always did it interactively, and that's how I'm going to do it. So if we go to deb vdb with fdisk, you can see it gives us this interactive prompt. If I hit M, it'll give me the very short list of commands that I could be passing into, into fdisk in order to get a different management tasks done. First of all, we're going to do a P for print. Same deal as with part ed. P will print the existing partitions on the disk. I left some free space at the end of this disk. We're going to make a new partition with an N. And it's going to ask us what partition number we want to use. Now, one of the things with MS-DOS partition tables versus GPT is, uh, and that doesn't mean I GPT, this is global <laughs> partition table GPT. With an MS-DOS based partition table, you get partitions one through four are your quote unquote primary partitions. And then when you get to four, if you create that as a partition and there's still space left on the disk, 
you can't make any more. So what you have to do is one through three can be primary partitions. And then number four, you make an extended partition and you can make more partitions within it. GPT doesn't have that limitation. You can see here, it says partition numbers and I can go up to 128, more than you'll need. If you've got 128 partitions on a standard physical disk, that seems pretty excessive. <laughs> Might be time to rethink how you built your application. We're going with partition number three and the defaults. So one thing I like about FDisk is it'll intelligently fill in the start and end of your partition based on the current size of your disk. If you didn't want to fill the rest of the disk, you would have wanted to figure out blocks, sectors. It's in sectors, but you can also specify in kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, or petabytes. <laughs> I could have said 300 megabytes and it would have made a 300 megabyte uh, partition. Okay, so that's done. If we hit W, that tells it to write the changes that we just made to the partition, and then it exits out of F, uh, out of S, yeah, out of F disk. Now let's clear again. And if we do that, actually here, let's just look at it. Actually here, remember I was using part ed print before. If I do F disk dash L and then dev VDB, it'll give me a similar output from F disk, right? So there we go. If I did that part ed dev, I got it right that time and thought I got it wrong. And backspace. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the partition table is related to the disk. Doesn't matter which utility you use to make it, makes it in the same way, and you can get back to it with F disk or part ed. And now we have another disk. I talked earlier about MKFS and the EXT4 and XFS variants of that tool. If you do MKFS and then double tab, you can see there's a bunch of other ones in here for making different file system types. You can make FAT and EXT2 and 3 and whatever CRAMFS is. I've never used CRAMFS. <laughs> I've heard of it. I've never, I don't really know what it's for. Minix, VFAT, MS-DOS, VFAT, I think is FAT32 versus FAT is FAT16. Yep. And these all have their own different, I don't know what MS-DOS is versus FAT or VFAT, but there we go. Maybe it's just an alias for one or the other. And these all have their own limitations and the compatibility. If I'm working on a system that needs interoperability with the Windows, I might use FAT or VFAT. There are extensions that'll use it NTFS as well, but they're not supported out of the box, right? So that's why that's not in this list here. All right. I mentioned there's a bunch of different options you can pass into MKFS. We're going to look at ext4 dash dash help will give us a bunch of those options. Obviously, that's like, oh, look, there's a ton of options. The man page is also super helpful. So you can see you can get better descriptions as to what all these different options are. But I'm going to tell you, you can specify the size of the inode table and how often the disk should be checked, I think, is something that you can specify at, at the time you create the partition or create the file system. Uh, there's a bunch of options. Block size, right? If mm -hmm. you've got a specific use case for the disk that says smaller block sizes work better for this particular application, then you, you have control over that. You can set the block size smaller. If you want to make it bigger, you make it bigger. Cluster size, root directory. I don't know what the root directory is even for here. Copy the contents of the given directory into the root directory of this file system. Oh, that's, oh, that's cool. cool. I didn't I had know no that idea existed. You could do that. <laughs> Learn something new every day. So there you go. And um, that's why I'm a podcast host. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, XFS has similar. Here, let's do the dash help first. So I think that one was a little bit easier to read. Yeah, so this one gives you a more verbose output. Apparently dash dash help isn't an option. It just assumed that I needed help because I passed in an option that didn't exist. But at any rate, you can see here, there's a bunch of different options you can pass into XFS. Same deal, right? This is about tuning that file system as you're laying it down, setting sec sector sizes and what kind of output you want from the tool as it's running. We made file systems, but we didn't mount them. We did talk about mount in our troubleshooting file systems episode but we're going to go ahead and use it here. Mount dash T XFS tells it what type of file system we're mounting. It generally detects this automatically. For me, it just feels like the right thing to do to not make it detected because I always worry that something's not going to get detected properly. My file system is going to get mounted wrong and then things are going to go horribly wrong. Although that's never happened to me. I'm just paranoid. We're going to say what dev. I got the end to be on that one. 
VDB1. <laughs> We're going to put it on slash mount because that's handy. You can see there's nothing in there because we didn't put any files there. But if we did a DF-H, we can see it now. If I did LSBLK, I think, will show me. LSBLK will show me that it's mounted now on slash mount. See here, right? All the tools that respect where the thing is mounted are now showing it that it's mounted there. And there's a bunch of different options to mount, which we're going to actually touch on as we talk about the next tool, LSBLK. Sorry, which is FS tab, Etsy FS tab. If we look at the man page for mount and go to line 30, it gives us all the mount options. Did I get to the right? Huh, it's not, it's not the right line. <laughs> Oh, no, wait, it's the FS tab. Was it man FS tab where I found this? Sorry, guys. No. All right, so apparently the line count that I found previously <laughs> while looking this up is not where I want. I wanted to look at the mount options. For general mount options and specific file systems. I can't get to that now because for whatever reason, my terminal is not... And I'm sorry for the dogs barking in the background, if you guys can hear them. They're going crazy over something. Anyway, there are mount options within the mount tool, which then translate to working with Etsy FS tab. Now, Etsy FS tab is where you tell the system how to mount, system, how to mount volumes at boot time or make shortcuts for mounting a volume. These are defined by UUID and that what was the command again. ID, it'll tell you the UUIDs for different partitions. So you can see VDA1. Let's see if the VDBs we made are here. There we go. UIDs for VDB1, 2, and 3. When mounting in Etsy FS tab, you can use that UUID. And the reason you might want to use the UUID is because that is unique. It's in the name, right? Universal or unique universal ID, I think is what UUID stands for. Maybe it's the other way around but it is a unique identifier. So if for some reason dev VDB becomes dev VDC, for example, or there's some underlying driver change or something that changes the, the block device path for that disk. This happens a lot with network attached or SAN attached. You reboot the machine and all disks come back in a different order. Now VDB is VDC, right? If you just said mount dev VDC one, that may change from boot to boot. It usually doesn't, but sometimes it does, right? And the UUID is to account for that sometimes it does use case. But in this case, it's hard to remember and type a UUID, but it's easy to remember and type dev VDB1, right? So I'm going to use that for my example. You can see the examples here. If you do UUID equals and then that UUID from block ID, you can use that interchangeably with the direct path to where you're mounting. So... We're going to say dev VDB1 should live on slash mount. Then you tell it what file system type. That one was XFS, if you recall. And then this column is options, mount options. Last time we talked about read only and read write as the only options that we were touching on. There's a whole bunch of options that you can pass to different file systems based on what they are, what they do, and what, what partition type that they are, right? We're going to go with defaults because that's what they're there for. But you could also say, oh, this is read only. Or I don't know, I'm having trouble. Think, uh, how about like, uh, is async one of them, I think? Makes it an asynchronous right mount. Anyway, you can comma separate and put different options in here. Okay, and then the next two columns are based on the order they're mounted and the time between file system checks, right? Yep. So you can see that the defaults here, everyone, everything's zero, zero but you can change those based on your use cases. So we're gonna stick with the zero and zero. And now if I U mount, well, let's clear the screen here. Now, if I do mount slash slash MNT, it'll read the FS tab. System D still uses the old one. I forgot to mention when you change the FS tab, system D is aware of mounts. So if you do a system CTL daemon reload, then that'll refresh that awareness from system D. But I think it should have still worked here. Just keep in mind, if you want system D to, to reflect changes in FS tab, you have to do that daemon reload. 
But now you can see that it's mounted. And if I reboot it, it would mount that at boot. Now, the only reason it wouldn't would be if the disk wasn't available at boot. And that's one of the dangers of putting a device inside of etcfs tab is if it's like network attached for example and the network doesn't come up if there's mm -hmm. if it's san attached and your hba or your um fiber channel nick or whatever doesn't come up uh then you could have problems at boot time which will halt the boot there's options you can put in there that call it a soft mount versus a hard mount that'll say you're allowed to skip this if you have to right we Touched on that a bit in our last episode. In our next episode, we're going to deeper on that. But just keep aware that keep aware that those exist. And that's that's essentially our toolbox.